Let's go. Um, I'm going to be talking today about Belarus. My name is um, Alex. I'm from Belarus originally. I'm doing the talks from here uh, here at um, Anarchist Day, Student Forum from time to time every year, more or less. Um, and I will be talking today in a little bit more, let's say, extended version. So I'm not going to tell you what Belarus is, where it is, and shit like that. Um, you were supposed to actually watch a video before this talk. Who watched those videos before this talk? Three people, four people. Wow. This is, I mean, others will have to enjoy the ride in the way and, you know, sporadically uh, search in Wikipedia what, what I'm saying. Uh, but it's not going to be super complicated, I hope. Uh, if you have questions during the talk, uh, you can raise your hands and maybe give a comment or question. Uh, but if you have like uh, existential things uh, you want to talk about, or the questions that are not connected with what I'm saying, you can leave that till the end, right? I hope I will be may uh, I will manage to fit into 45 minutes. If I want, I'm very sorry. You will have to suffer a little bit more. But yeah. So. I'm an anarchist, I'm an activist from Belarus. I moved to Germany at some point in the past, and I've been organized in the different solidarity structures, anti-repression structures for the last 15 years. And through this 15 years, I kind of like um, lift myself for repressions, but also have a lot of comrades who lived for repressions and ended up with um, a very kind of bizarre knowledge that in the healthy society you're not supposed to know, like torture and uh, how to avoid arrests and shit like that. Um, what this talk about is uh, about repressions, violence, um, it is about war, you have to be aware about that and if you have problems with that, this is the only trigger warning, so I will be talking about death, I will be talking about violence. Uh, from the state perspective. And if you feel triggered, you can also leave at any point. Feel free to do that. There is no um, shame in that. We all get fucked up by the system. Uh, yeah, so, and what is Anarchist Black Cross uh, Belarus? It is an organization that supports anarchist, anti-fascist, anti-authoritarian activists, but also political activists whose values are kind of like in alignment with anarchist perspective and anarchist struggle. Um, the organization exists also for um, 15 years, but anarchist Black Cross organizations actually exist in Eastern Europe for over like 100 years and were alternative to uh, like uh, political support structures uh, that was like built together with anarchist communists and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so that's who we are pretty much. The current development of Belarusian regime, so in case you didn't watch the talk and you didn't check out what Belarus uh, is in Wikipedia, Belarus is a dictatorship, right? Very bad dictatorship with a horrible person ahead, wearing a leather jacket, horrible style. Still, Belarus is a dictatorship and I will be talking only about the current news of this dictatorship, right? Uh, the first thing it to mention is basically since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Lukashenko became kind of a vassal of Russian state. Um, he is politically dependent, he's economically dependent, he is also in many ways socially dependent on Russia that is building up this um, kind of a new narrative of the Russian world where Lukashenko fits. So he's like not going with the Belarusian nationalism or in any way, but rather um, actually tries to be part of the Russian Empire narrative in the region. And whatever he's trying to do is most probably, and in many cases, is actually like agreed with the Russian state. So, for example, if uh, Belarus doesn't enter the war right now with Ukraine, it is not because Lukashenko is such a tough cookie and he thinks, hey, we shouldn't fight with Ukraine, they're great people, but rather um, he's not fighting because it's kind of like, it's okay with Putin and you don't get um, involved in the war uh, crimes so much. Um, and yeah, this is kind of like... Um, and it's uh, very important in defining political dynamics in general in the country, right? Uh, the dependence on Russian state is dependence on also Russian ideology, on Russian media structures and things like that, and also Russian prop like a repression machine and all this shit. Uh, also, since uh, 2020, since the last protest that happened in Belarus, Lukashenko have been reshuffling the power inside of the state. He's a little bit paranoid because a bunch of people who were part of his um, like close circle of trusted people jumped the boat when the protest happened. Um, and before that, he was also paranoid. So he's like a very paranoid, uh, maybe a little bit in a comic manner, you know, the guy who's sitting and always checking his shoulders and shit like that. Um, and 
because of that, he changed a little bit the structure of the state. So, for example, he, they created this commission in case the president is dead. There will be a commission from uh, KGB and some other uh, internal, like, power structures and power structures, like um, repressive um, apparatus that will form up the temporary government and stuff like that. So it's not really reliant on like second in command or things like that. Then um, there is like a parallel parliament built recently that is called uh, People's Assembly. Yeah, People's Assembly. Very pop populist, right? Um, reality is that People's Assembly collects like several thousand people from all around the country and what they're doing is basically sitting and listening to Lukashenko speaking for four hours. Um, and that's pretty much it. The idea behind it is that um, they take um, people from different uh, business structures um, and people from different like power interest structures, bring them to Minsk. And in theory, it's supposed to be kind of an alternative parliament. Um, in the sense of that they also have decision power, they can discuss and change economics and politics in the country, but they are not elected. So they are just uh, people who president picks up and who he talks in front of. Um, Belarus also uh, moved recently, and not recently, like from 2020, there were more and more steps made uh, to move from authoritarian system to totalitarian system. Um, I kind of figure out that Germans don't know, like a lot of Germans don't know the difference. Um, although you all study fucking political science and all the social things. Uh, but the, the, the main difference here that is important is that authoritarian regimes do not try to intervene in the private life of the human kind. Um, it is with human beings. Um, it is um, what is more important in an authoritarian regime is that uh, you obey authority, you can live in the way you want, and you can have your fucking hipster bars and, and stuff like that, but don't get involved in the power games, right? Don't try to fight the power or try to change the way the power is arranged. And the difference with a totalitarian regime is that totalitarian regime tries to control all the aspects of your life. Um, so it, it invades not only your political thought, it also invades your social interaction with other people, even if they're not political. And to give you an example of that, uh, we have, for example, random controls in metro stations where the cops can pick you up and check your phone and see if you're subscribed to um, political channels that are um, critical of the government. Or you made some comments in com communication with your friends where you say something bad about our great leader. Um, so things like that and and it's kind of like invasive to the to the extent that you never know when is this going to happen also at the working places people are controlled there is um, back in the game uh, this ideological committees at the working places so you have like former kgb workers that are coming to factories that are coming to universities and they control the ideological atmosphere of the place and you might have like i don't know five fucking ideological workers and the rest of the university is collapsing collapsing but the ideological part of the of the whole system is very important yeah um as for belarus and its role in the war in ukraine i, I think a lot of you have seen that belarus was and is engaged in the war in ukraine uh, Belarus is currently training Russian soldiers on its ground for preparing like, to go to war. And it's kind of like a safe ground for Russian troops because Ukrainians are not allowed to hit Belarusian territories. Belarus is not officially involved in the war. Um, Prigozhin was hanging out in Belarus for a little bit, but it didn't end up so good for him. Uh, but in general, like, Belarus plays um, an important role as an ally uh, for Russia in the war in Ukraine. And when Putin says, I don't know, there is a chemical weapon somewhere next to Kiev, uh, Lukashenko repeats that narrative. So he, Belarus is now basically like reamplifier of the Russian propaganda in the informational sphere, uh, but also um, kind of like a, an extra wing of the Russian military industrial complex where a lot of military um, products are made in Belarus. Um, this is also historically because Belarus was part of the Soviet Union and in the Soviet Union they also had a little bit of decentralization of production of military shit um, and Belarus kind of remains in this um, remains in this hemisphere. Yeah, and in general it, I think a lot of uh, Belarusians feel um, in one way or another engaged in this war uh, because a lot of uh, people in Ukraine are uh, people that we know or people are our relatives and, and stuff like that. Um, 
The last part is actually the thing that a lot of people are asking from time to time um, at the presentations. So what happens if Lukashenko dies? Um, yesterday I was talking to a friend from Russia and she said, what happens when Putin dies? Um, I think like, honestly, there will be a huge party, but um, a party by Belarusian people, not the political party or something like that. Um, there will be a huge party, but at the same time, there is a very clear, um, I think, among a lot of people, understanding that the system is not built only for Lukashenko. Although he's a very important role in this whole authoritarian regime, but reality is that if he dies in the current conditions, uh, Belarus is too important for Russia to let it go. So most probably there will be a new Lukashenko who will be way more um, uh, kind of friendly with Russia, who will be way more friendly with Putin, and it will be just basically like a governor sent from uh, Moscow to control the uh, colonize, colonized territories. Yeah, so the party, but nothing really expected right now because Belarus is too dependent on, on the empire. Yeah. The war. Um, yeah, the war is going on for... Um, kind of a very bizarre way to say, but almost three years, two years and a half. Uh, at least three people from this picture already dead. Um, this is like an anti-authoritarian unit um, that was collected from um, anarchists and anti-authoritarians in Ukraine in the first days of full-scale invasion when the anarchists were trying to um, resist it collectively. Yeah, and the war is... Um, the war is shit, just in case you wonder and somebody tells you that I'm a fucking supporter of war. Um, so for Belarus and Belarusian society, first weeks after full-scale invasion were also mobilizational moments. A lot of people went to the streets, a lot of people started organizing again, like with an extra, um, how would you say, fire in your ass. And this uh, in Belarus was very violently suppressed. People went to prison. Um, some people were actually, um, like shot to the legs, not shot dead, but rather like um, shot by the firearms without the uh, mortal injuries or something like that. And um, by now, most of the protests inside of Belarus kind of died out. But reality is that by now, after 2020, so we are like four years after the uprising in Belarus, uh, there is also a huge Belarusian diaspora that exists uh, all around Europe. And the Belarusian diaspora also got mobilized um, against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So there is a lot going on as well there. Like a lot of Belarusians are currently involved in solidarity work uh, with Ukrainian people. And I'm talking not only about anarchists or anti-fascists, but I'm talking about like all the spectrum of um, social, political people from extreme right to, to the anarchists. And even like the people who are normally not politically engaged in any way. Uh, also, because of the war, Belarus went into like a full-scale militarization mode. Um, one of the things that a lot of states in the region figured out is that you can be prepared for the war on the paper, but reality of the war is very different. So Russian state was expecting to get rid of like Ukrainian state within a couple of days, within a week or so. It didn't work out, and it didn't work out because Russian military was shit at that point. And uh, Belarusian state also saw that, and many other states saw that, that they kind of like started changing the way they're um, organizing the military and so on. And in Belarus, they started buying new equipment, they started more trainings of the, of the units and so on. So Belarus is, even though it was preparing for the war very long, it is preparing for the real war now. And yeah, you have to understand that kind of Belarus was always a militarized country because it was always like a, you know, a, a kid of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was going for the war every fucking single day, you know, like really, we are going to, do, to bre break the backs of those capitalist bastards and comrades and shit like that. Um, so like to give you an example, I was growing up with my parents bringing me to the military parades, right, and watching the tanks and was like, wow, very good. Uh, when I grew up a little bit, I, I figure out, you know, for example, like the the infrastructure of the city is getting destroyed by the tanks just driving through the city. Um, yeah, and we were all pre we were all like preparing for the war as kids. You know, we were playing war um, with other kids. Is bizarre, right? You play fucking war, and um, 
this is something that exists in mentality of the people a lot in Belarusian people. Although we don't want to have war or whatever, like there is this still collective memory of the Second World War and the horrors in, in Belarus is like um, at least one fourth of the population that was living in the Belarusian territory was killed during the uh, Second World War. But at the same time, now the Russian propaganda and the Russian world um, ideology is kind of like invading Belarusian society. Um, and in that sense, like more and more people are becoming also very ready for the war, for the new round of the war. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, Belarus uh, was in the 90s uh, one of the few and the f one of the first countries that actually gave up its nuclear um, weapons that uh, was inherited from the Soviet times. So Soviets had weapons, nuclear weapons all around the world, right? And when it collapsed, when it fractured Belarus, Ukraine and some other countries said, okay, we don't want to have it. And uh, the nuclear weapons went to Russia. Um, very, very good idea, right? Um, but they are there now, and um, recently, because of the war, Russians moved their nuclear um, weapons also to Belarus. So Belarus got back uh, nuclear weapons. Kind of officially, it still belongs to Russians, but it's on the Belarusian territory. And at the end of the day, Lukashenko is a fucking mad um, person, so he can, you know, at some point just click some buttons and get the shit going. Um, yeah, so he's very happy, but Belarus became like one of the pl uh, platforms of the Russian pretty much nuclear zone of control. And this is also one of the things to understand from this imperial perspective, right? As soon as, as your country gets nuclear weapons, you're fucked. Because the country that put nuclear weapons in your country will make a lot of um, influence and a lot of political pressure to keep it in the way that it's still aligned to you. So this is another, like, another of these kind of small lines that uh, the governments are getting hooked uh, to be controlled by the foreign powers. Um, as for the current um, role in the war efforts, uh, there are still things flying through Belarus. There are still some rockets flying from Belarus. Recently, there were news that uh, Russian drones were actually hit down in Belarus because uh, the, the Shahid drones from Iran, um, they might have some troubles with GPS or whatever they're using, and they were flying on the Belarusian territories. <laughs> There were some comments from like Belarusian military, like we didn't know what to do because it was supposed to be in Ukraine, you know, um, and they actually like destroyed the drones and uh, also, you know, like for an average pro-Russian Belarusian, it was very bizarre that you know now we're destroying Russian military equipment. Uh, but f this is the postmodernist world, you know, like the, the shit is going on. Um. Status of repressions. Um, repressions are still going on. The repressions are never fucking ending in this country. On the picture you can see uh, the building of uh, the central office of the KGB. Uh, Belarus still has KGB. Um, it, it's kind of like a brand that Belarusian secret forces uh, maintain for longer. And the repressions that they're keeping are quite severe. Um, there were recently statistics published about um, how many people were arrested and tried in the past years. So over 50,000 people were detained in period from 2020 to 2023, so in three years. Uh, to give you a little bit of a perspective, this is um, in the country of 9.5 million people. Maybe by now it's 9 million people. I don't know how many people live in Belarus by this time. Uh, but reality is that this is shitloads of people. This is way more people that were at the Brandmauer demonstrations in Dresden. Um, and uh, this is the people who went through like 15 years, uh, 15, 15 days in prison. Uh, many of them paid fines and went through like very harsh treatment. It's not like you're getting detained, you're sitting on the bench and, went, uh, and wait for your uh, procedure, but rather like you go through a lot of violence from the police, from the state, um, just to go through these per short periods of detention. There were at least um, 5,472 criminal prosecutions in the same period. Um, at least is that we don't know about all the pros criminal prosecutions that are connected with the political um, repressions. This is only on only those who are getting re um, reported. And there people were getting quite serious sentencing from, I don't know, from like a couple of years in so-called prison houses where you live in the prison and you work in, um, 
in at work up to like 20 21 years in prison uh, depending for the actions that you did like uh, but also to understand 2021 year were not uh, for you know killing a general of Belarusian army or something like that but it was more like burning a police car or something like that so most of the uh, punishments through the criminal um, prosecution are disproportionately harsh just to uh, make a point make an example of the people who are um, participating in the resistance against Lukashenko uh, and at least 3380 political prisoners um, in the Belarusian prisons of, I think, like 35, 40,000 um, is the capacity of the prisons. So you have more than, no, less, a little bit less than 10% of the people who are sitting in prison are political prisoners. And this is kind of like also affecting the way people are sitting in prison. Um, this is also statistics from, um, from human rights organization. Uh, no. Yes, from human rights organization that just recently got published as well um, about political prosecutions per year. And there was a certain hope, I think, back in 2020 and 2021 that um, the level of repressions will come down. Like the, the state, there was the surprising, the state took care of it in the sense of like repressing it completely. And slowly the, the amount of repressions will go down. But reality is that it continues and it doesn't fucking stop. It actually goes up. And we see that uh, people in 20, now 2024 are still getting prosecuted for the um, uh, protests in 2020. Right, so you still get people who are ending up in prison for three years because they went to the street um, back four years ago, and they they were not arrested in the past three years, but then later cops figured it out or somebody reported them and things like that. Uh, also talking about uh, repressions, we have quite a tight social control. That's what I was talking with uh, about the ideological workers at the working places, but also a lot of people are keeping an eye on each other. So there is an atmosphere of. Um, like paranoia, because you don't know who is going to report you to the police if your neighbors are fucked up in the head and they will um, talk to the cops or somebody else. Uh, so people actually, through the social control, keep to themselves. A lot of people don't talk about politics at all or they talk about politics uh, behind the closed doors at the kitchen. And it, it's kind of like an atmosphere of the Soviet times, but in a very different manner, because there is way more mechanisms of technological control, right? In the Soviet Union, the state could go around um, next to you and listen what you're saying. But right now, because we are all fucking digitalized, our communications are all available for, you know, control and um, evaluation of the police forces and stuff. Yeah. Then um, short-term arrest is a threat. So if you are in any way politically, uh, not even politically active, but you're like making political statements, having political position, uh, there is always like this short prison term arrests. And by that, I mean like 15, 25 days in prison. It's very easy to get. You get like five minutes in court and then you go to prison. Um, and those are, uh, apart from like you're just living in a very fucked up condition, overcrowded cells, uh, no sleeping place, you sleep just on the ground and, and stuff. Uh, also, you eat shit, so you get out of the prison, your, your belly is fucked up. But also, you lose your job in most of the cases. Um, and <clears throat> Sorry. And this is another point of uh, pressure. Like you are, maybe you're stuck with a credit for the flat or something like that. And then you have to um, take care of that and kind of like stay away from the politics. And this is one of the mechanisms that was there also in the Soviet times, uh, just to make people indebted and then keep them at work so they don't get involved in the political life. Uh, also repressions of relatives. We've seen that as a kind of a reaction to the fact that a lot of people left. There are like over 100,000 people who left the country in the past um, three years. And um, those people are hard to get. Like um, Russian state is maybe doing that kind of like um, targeted hit, uh, hitman attacks, but Belarusian state doesn't have these resources. So most of the KGB agents are still staying in Belarus and actually they're forbidden to leave the country. Um, and in that frame, the, the state still have relatives, like you still have relatives, right, in, in the country. So those are becoming the target of the attack. Uh, they can be sent to prison. They can be just harassed or kicked out from the work. Um, there are a lot of mechanisms uh, how your relatives can suffer from your own actions. And this is one of the ways uh, the state was trying to apply pressure or tries to apply pressure still on the people who have relatives, but they're being politically active outside and like giving these talks, for example, and shit like that. 
and also um, putting pressure on the people who are fighting in Ukraine against Russian invasion. So when the Belarusian state figures out that you are, you know, like part of the Ukrainian International Legion, they put you on the terrorist list and they make you like a horrible person, confiscate everything that is associated with you in Belarus and stuff like that. Uh, question of property. I, I know that I'm an anarchist and we are all against property, uh, but reality is that um, Back in the Soviet times, a lot of people, or after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of people ended up with uh, privatized flats. I don't think that people in Germany know about that. Um, like in East Germany, the poor GDR citizens didn't get a flat uh, after the collapse of the regime. Um, and I'm very sorry for that. But in Belarus, a lot of people have flats, right? And it goes inherited. So if my, I don't know, grandmother dies, she owned the flat and it passes further and further and further. And it's kind of like one of the pressure points as well. You can't pay rent. This is also an important factor. So a lot of people are still living in with their parents and stuff. And the state is now confiscating most of the property from the people who are in prison, whether, or the people who left the country and they're put on the list of terrorists. Uh, so this property can be sold out and put back into the budget. And this is happening en masse. Like uh, they're always selling the cars from the people, they're selling the flats and, and stuff like that. And it's kind of like everything that you make out from your fucking life, you know, life savings and, and stuff. And it also applies some pressure on the people. Uh, there are also constant attempts of recruiting people, recruiting people inside of the prisons. So, for example, there is um, one of the person from the anti-fascists that we were supporting in the past years, um, and the information came up that he was recruited by the by the guards in the prison to become a snitch. So he was like snitching on other people for several years already, and those people were ending up like in solitary confinements and stuff. But also, they're recruiting relatives of the people who are in prison. Uh, trying to figure out the networks of support, the solidarity networks and, safe, and things like that. And also, they are trying to recruit people abroad. So if you are ending up somewhere in Poland or in Lithuania, uh, there is a chance that the cops will write you and say, like, hey, you want to work for us and get back to our great country? Um, which is a very stupid thing. I don't know what are the preconditions of actually becoming a fucking Belarusian snitch, because Belarusian state cannot give you so much. Uh, but there are, paradoxically, quite a lot of people who are working for Belarusian state within the Belarusian diaspora as well. And also, we had recently a case where one of the um, a husband of an anarchist who is now in uh, prison for five years, he was approached and kind of like threatened into recruitment, saying it's whether you go to prison or you work for us. And he left the country. Uh, but taking into account that they did that to him, it means that they're also doing that to a lot of different people. It's not going to like, be the only example, rather this is like a systematic thing that is happening in the country. Um, also, recruitment in diaspora, as I was saying, very weird thing, and people who are working for the Belarusian cops are fucking assholes. Um, buyouts from problems, this is a very... Um, strange way of dealing with repressions but basically like the cops figure out because you're stupid enough to put um, pictures from the protest on your Instagram they figure out that you were part of the protest they come to you arrest you start um, questioning you and then they figure out or you actually have on your bank account maybe 20,000 euros you're working your whole fucking life for and they say listen you can go free just give us 15,000 and people fucking do that. People pay Belarusian state, um, pay themselves out from repressions that can potentially come from whatever cops decide. Because at the end of the day, Belarusian state is now working and was working for very many years as a mafia. You know, like they just come and uh, shake you and get your money and get your health and get your whatever you have um, for whatever they want. And in that sense, like the person, for example, who got shaken recently, like, they can put you in prison for 20 fucking years. They don't need a reason to put you in prison. They just can't do that. This is not the game where there are any rules, you know? And in that sense, like, it, the, the payouts are working, and people are still working their asses out to pay back to Belarusian state so you can stay free. It's, a, it's, it's a, like, you know, if you read the history of the state, this is the original sense of the state, you know, like, going and shaking people, otherwise killing them or sending them to the fucking prisons. Um, there is also a comeback program. 
uh, I think some of you might know this is like something reminding of a uh, German state trying to reintegrate people who are part of the left extremist scene. So you can go to the police and you will get support and, um, and you will become a normal citizen. In Belarus this means that, oh, you left our great country to some poor capitalist assholes, come back and we will forgive you everything. And bizarrely, some people actually believe in that shit. So last year, there were dozens of people who came back to the country and they were prosecuted and ended up in the fucking prison. Um, so this is also, you know, a speciality of a, of a migrants at the end of the day. You know, like when you end up out of your home country or your, I don't know, your relatives, your social groups, your social peer groups, um, you end up from time to time in the situation where you're so desperate you're actually going back knowing that uh, well the perspectives are very grim but I'd rather be like living this you know risky situation than being where I am and there are also for example a lot of Ukrainians who are going back to Ukraine despite the war going on and stuff like that yeah um, and uh, also what to mention here is the question of death penalty um, Another thing you can figure out from Wikipedia article about Belarus. Belarus is the last country in Europe that has death penalty. And although like Russia is also has death penalty, but it's, there is a moratorium on it. Uh, what happens in Belarus, they fucking shoot you. They shoot you in the head um, and they execute every year two, three people, uh, mostly for violent crimes, but there were several people executed for like political prosecutions in, in back in the days. Also, Belarusian state was very honest, and Lukashenko was very honest in the way they were treating um, organized crime in the 90s. And he recent, like recently, maybe like five, seven years ago, admitted that they were executing pretty much um, uh, organized crime lords and whatever. I don't know how you call people participating in organized crime, like not organized crime activists, but something like that, right? Um, uh, so they were executing those people, and in general, like this is another part of the Belarusian state. It is very violent, it is ready to use that violence, it is ready to kill people, um, and it's doing that, and you have people who are trained in killing people, right? So this is another part of like the country that is theoretically not at war, but the state is killing people regularly. But there is resistance, right? So not everything is so fucking bad. The, the trend of prosecuting people also means that there are people still, despite all the challenges, continue to organize, continue to resist. On the picture you can see a relay box from um, a railroad like distribution network. So this is the, another side of digitalization. Those boxes are responsible for automation of uh, railroad traffic, right? And those boxes are very expensive. So if you burn that shit, and I'm not talking about Germany, I'm just telling you what happened in Belarus, right? So if you burn that shit, the traffic um, is paralyzed for very long. And um, in Belarus, this was happening in 2020, uh, but then when the full-scale uh, invasion started, people started uh, burning that stuff as well. And this kind of like played a role in paralyzing movement of Russian soldiers uh, through Belarus. Um, something to mention, solidarity between the workers, um, there are, despite all this social control, despite all these attempts to, you know, like repress people in submission, in full submission, um, human beings are this kind of like a very bizarre creatures that strive for freedom. It doesn't matter how much you try to oppress them, and Belarus is not an island on the other planet, right? We are living in the world where you get information, where you still learn how people live in the other places, and people are striving for that. So there is a lot of solidarity at the working places, people talk to each other, people still get provoked by the political ideas, they still read news that are forbidden officially, right? Um, and this is um, one of the ways to resist. You're not, of course, taking weapons and you're not doing proactive resistance, but you're resisting the, 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 the sole notion of destruction of your informational human being, right? Um, there are also very established networks of basically smuggling people out of the country. And this is like semi-legalized. This is the bizarre part about European Union acceptance of resistance against Lukashenko. So you have a lot of people who are coming from Belarus as Belarusians illegally to Lithuania and Poland crossing the border illegally, which is Another side, you know, like um, questionable development because from one side as a Belarusian you can enter European Union as a refugee without any problems but then if you're coming from Iraq or 
I don't know, Somalia or whatever you're coming from through Belarus, you will be pushed back to the fucked up conditions of Belarus and swamps and stuff like that, which is ca happening still even with the new Polish government. Um, direct actions in Russia, uh, so I was telling you about the question of uh, violence and uh, death penalty. A lot of people, because of the death penalty, moved to um, sabotage the war eff Russian war efforts into Russia, where there is no official death penalty, but recently, I think statistics said, around seven people were killed in the past year uh, by the Russian state for actions of sabotage. So what Russians started doing is basically not arresting people who are doing sabotage on railroads or in some infrastructure, but rather just basically executing people at, at the spot and then pretending that those people were resisting or something like that. And this is another side of like repressive apparatus. Uh, prisons. Prisons is also the place where um, there is resistance happening. But prisons is also the place where most of the state violence happens behind the closed doors. And um, these days, like four years after the uprising, we know uh, about the situation in prison only through people who are coming out of prisons. There is very little communication between people sitting inside of the prisons and the outside world. Um, this is mostly limited to like informal talks like, hey, I watched this movie, it's amazing and stuff. But if you start talking about the conditions of uh, incarceration in Belarus and send it to your um, friends, then this is getting deleted, and actually most of the political prisoners um, are getting denied their communication with the outside world. So your letters are getting thrown in the in the junk uh, from the very beginning. So talking about the general prisoner population, as I was saying, there are around 40,000 people in, in prisons, and the conditions for those people are very bad. And in general, uh, to give you an example again, even before the current situation. Like back in 2014, uh, Belarusian prisoners went on strike, but on strike you go in Belarus not in the way that we're not going to work or something like that. They were um, opening their bellies. So you get a knife, you cut yourself open, and this is the way you kind of try to protest um, the prison administration, right? And this was just the general prisoner population. So those were not explicitly political prisoners that were targeted by the state to be destroyed, right? And um, talking about political prisoners, so this is like the population that ended up there from 2020. There were some political prisoners before. Um, this is the people who uh, got like an extra focus of the state. So you have a prison, but inside of the prison you have population that is split into political prisoners and normal prisoners. And back in the days, if you read the history, political prisoners were the people who were sticking together. You go to prison, you learn the revolutionary thought, and you go back out and you fucking destroy the monarchy. And that's how one of the ways people were ending up in the revolutionary movement um, in October Revolution in Russia and, and Russian Empire and stuff like that. But these days, being a political prisoner is, is a fucking huge extra pressure and extra isolation that is applied on you. Um, you're not allowed communication with outside in most of the cases. You're not allowed um, communication with other prisoners inside of the prison, so you're isolated. You're not allowed to communicate with other political prisoners. Um, they have patches, um, I don't have it on the other slide, they have like extra markings. I, I think if you learn German history, you know that Germans did that as well, and Soviets did that. This is actually like a saying um, a lot of repressive governments are doing. So you get a marking that you're an extremist in prison and the prison guards know who you are and they have a better chances of controlling what you're doing and stuff. Um, yeah, what else? No letters, postcards from the outside. So if you're writing letters, for example, to Belarusian prisoners, don't expect that you will get to them in any way. And this is also part of this program of isolation, of keeping people outside. Limited support from relatives. Uh, quite often relatives are not allowed any visitations. Re relatives are not allowed any communication. Very rarely the letters are going through. And this is also another way of, like, basically the world abandons you, right? Um, there were recently several waves of release of political prisoners that is unclear. Because Lukashenko sees uh, political prisoners all in all as a, as a value that you can trade. Um, and he normally gets certain benefits from European Union or from US when he releases prisoners. So if you release like 50 people, most probably you will get some sanction, sanctions lifted or some other benefits. And historically that's what he was doing qu quite successfully. Like uh, the story of cooperation of European Union and uh, Belarusian regime from 2014 to 2020 was based on this um, 
prior exchange of political prisoners. So Lukashenko released political prisoners. Europe said Lukashenko is great. We can work with him now. And uh, I think like there is a hope also that you know if Lukashenko releases everyone, then the the situation can normalize. But the problem is that the war is still going in Ukraine, and Lukashenko is locked on Putin. He's not going to get out of this group. Um, and on top of that, like some of the people who got you know um, released, they got recently rearrested. So you get this kind of a notion: I release you, and then if you don't fuck out, uh, fuck um, out of the country, which is expected from you. So a lot of political prisoners who are coming out of the prison, um, they're told you should leave the country, like you shouldn't stay in Belarus. And if you stay and you continue to create some troubles for the regime, you get rearrested and end up in the fucking prison. Um, state of anarchist movement in Belarus, we still have some individuals who are active um, in one way or another. Uh, there was a group uh, that was called Black Sparrows and they were um, doing just some graffitis, maybe leaflets. Uh, they ended up right now in prison and we figure out that this group is made up from mostly from teenagers. So they were like 16, 17 years old when they got arrested. And that's for you to understand, that's a generation, the new generation of anarchists who get um, kind of inspired by the anarchist ideas and anarchist activists um, after the uprising. So they didn't know any moment in their life where they were politically so engaged. And uh, now they're in prison and they're charged with like um, preparing terrorist acts, which is up to the death penalty. Although, like this, I mean, as I said, the state doesn't prove anything in Belarus. Uh, there are quite a lot of people in exile. There are several organized groups. There is our group in exile. There is also a group of anarchists in Warsaw. There is a group of anarchists in Vilnius. Um, so Belarusian diaspora sticks to like continuation of the political struggle with the perspective that maybe one day we will be able, you know, to pack our backpacks, cross the fucking border illegally in the other direction, and liberate our homes. Um, yeah. Uh, there are also quite a bunch of Belarusian anarchists in Ukraine at this point. Uh, some of them ended up there after 2020. Some of them went there after 2022 uh, when the full-scale invasion started. Um, so Belarusian anarchists are also getting involved quite actively in, in the struggle against the Russian invasion with uh, a bunch of people who were already killed. And many of those people who were killed in Ukraine from the anarchist movement were the people who were a little bit older. So they're like from generations of punk rockers, I don't know, and uh, anti-fascists. Some of them got politicized even earlier than I was politicized back in the days. And this is also like a huge loss for the movement. And we also have a lot of people in exile who lose political interest. So you have to understand that this is like a dynamic, the, the natural dynamic of the uh, of the fucked up political conditions you're living. So you're born in a dictator dictatorship, you live in the dictatorship, you struggle against dictatorship. And even when I was like traveling between, like, you know, you live Belarus, you, you have this kind of like a huge weight that is going off your back, you know, because you know, okay, so the Belarusian cops are behind. They're like, I can have a week off of this whole burden that I'm carrying. And for a lot of people who migrated after 2020, this is also the case. Like you live in this kind of like a very intense moments of your life where you are struggling, where you're ending up in prison, where you're ending up being tortured and so on. And then you end up in Poland or in Germany where mostly things are okay by now, right? And, um, or for now. And in that sense, a lot of people are losing political affiliation. They, they think, okay, we don't need anarchist revolution in Poland uh, or in Germany. We can leave actually quite okay um, in comparison. Of course, everything in comparison, in comparison to Belarus. Uh, there is also a huge amount of people sitting in prison. There are over 30 anarchists and anti-fascists who are now in Belarusian prisons. And this is massive. You have to understand that Belarusian movement, by the time the repression started in 2020, was around maybe like 50 people, right? 60 people. And now we have 30 people in Belarusian prisons. We have people fighting in war in Ukraine. Uh, we have, um, I don't know, several comrades who died in Ukraine. So the movement is like shrinking a lot, getting repressed, but somehow still, you know, like fights back and tries to survive. Um, what people are facing in prisons, I think, is quite often hard to comprehend for you in Germany. And I think I can't, like, I, I don't know how to break that. This is one of the challenges that we were talking with comrades. Like, how can I explain the world that we are living? Because 
you have no fucking clue. Um, and this can be arrogant from my side, right? But reality is that sometimes or quite often it is very hard to imagine the influence of violence and influence of torture on you, you know, like or on the people. Because you never, like, it, it never came into your reality. It never came into your world. And in that sense, the conditions inside of the prisons, I can just, you know, I can tell you. You know, like, for example, comrades are sitting for weeks in in a cold box, right? So they, they lock you in a solitary confinement. You don't have a bed or something like that. And you spend there quite a lot of time, and it's freezing. Like, that's the, that's the whole point of it, right? And it's kind of like a Soviet torture, um, or even before that, the, the Russian Empire did. And the idea is basically to freeze you. Um, they don't kill you, but they freeze you to the point where you break. And a lot of people are, you know, like basically surviving in these cells. And like one of the comrades who was in this cell, he was writing back that, you know, one of the nights he had to do 500 push-ups, I don't know, 300 sit-ups and stuff like that just to survive. You know, you have to like keep your body warm because it's so fucking cold. And he was like sleeping for 10 minutes, then you wake up, do a half an hour workout, then you sleep 10 minutes again. And this is the conditions that not only him is, was going through, but this is the conditions thousands and thousands of people in Belarusian prisons are going through right now, right now, literally. Um, and despite all of that, <laughs> Um, people are still resisting. People are still going on strikes. Like recently, we got news of one of the comrades in like highly high secure prison, uh, organized together with other prisoners, and they went on strike. In that sense, they were just going like crazy, bashing the doors and stuff, uh, because there was some crazy shit going on. Like even taking into account the crazy shit is going on, so there was something o extraordinary crazy shit going on um, that they started protesting with the other prisoners and stuff. Um, talking about people who are in prison, the list of anarchist prisoners, um, those are some of the pictures. I don't have time to talk about any of them. Um, some of them wrote books about their experience in prison before they ended up in prison. Some people got released. For example, Kristina Cherenkova got released and she's living now in Poland. Um, but a lot of people are still are still in prison. A lot of every every person, not a lot of them, every person in this uh, in, in those slides is actually the person of their own personal story, um, whose struggle, whose life, and the struggle in that life led to where they are. But also, you have to understand that life in prison is not the end of life. Like they're continuing to fight, and this is not the pictures of people who are, you know, gone. But rather the people who are fighting on a daily basis with a very oppressive machine um, of the state and um, and the fucking uh, incarceration. Yeah. Yeah. This is the um, Vitaly Shushlov is the guy who started cooperating with the cops. So he's on the slide, but he was supposed he will be removed in in future. Last slide, um, how to help. I hope you want to help. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of actually causes right now to get mobilized and war in Ukraine or the horrors in Palestine or the war in Myanmar, the civil war in Myanmar. And th there are a lot of things, right? So quite often it is feeling like we are actually competing with each other, um, like com comrades competing with each other to get attention of the first world people to get a little bit of your support. Um, but I hope you want to help Belarus um, anarchist, uh, anarchist Black Cross, and you want to help people in Belarus. So we have like Liberal Pay, Ko-Fi, Patreon, Stripe, uh, whatever you feel like, digitalization. We also have possibility that you give me cash, and this is anonymous, and nobody will figure out who you donate to. Um, yeah, and we kind of like encourage people to donate continuously. So maybe for you, you know, like to give me. 50 euro is already a lot, but if you start donating five euro per month, it can make a difference. I sound like a fucking NGO worker, but anyway, like it's very important. We, we don't get any funds from European Union or from US aid or from CIA. Um, although sometimes we're getting, you know, like blamed for that. Never seen those money. CIA most probably is like fucked up. Um, but we are depending on individual donations you can do that um, yourself and feel like I did something good. Like, you know, maybe you never did something good in your life and here you can be like, good job. Um, there are one-time donations. We also have merch, not anymore, but tomorrow there will be also uh, merch from ABC Belarus outside so you can consume and feel also good because you got a t-shirt and you can show it to your friends and you were to be like, yeah, I saw this fucked up person from Belarus. Um, 
So this is also there, um, join the resistance. I think this is an important factor that our fight against the dictatorship, and by this time we understand it very well, is not limited to Belarus. I mean, we can't stop the Belarusian regime without destroying the Russian regime, which um, a lot of actually European countries don't want to see destroyed, rather pacified in some uh, way or another. And yeah, joining the, the resistance and joining the fight for the free society is essential for spread of the ideas of freedom uh, through the world. And now I sound like I'm from US government. Um, but I'm not. I'm talking not about you know supporting the states, but rather I'm talking about supporting grassroots organizing around the world and being part of that resistance. This is something that made me a person who I am and uh, like brought me to the road that I took and kind of like I value this a lot. Being part of the resistance for um, against the dictatorship, being part of resistance for free society without capitalism is something fucking amazing, and I can just recommend this. Um, yeah, spread the information, spread the information about Belarus, spread the information about struggles. Um, the important factor here is not only to demotivate you and to tell you like, you should never fucking go to Belarus, otherwise this, um, you, otherwise you will end up in the situation like the guy from Berlin who was sentenced to death penalty, but rather see the people are resisting. People are fighting despite all the challenges. And people are very resilient, you know, like there is a lot of violence and a lot of pressure and a lot of hard times. And, you know, maybe uh, you still think that you are safe, but the world is very crazy and the safety of the German state, what the German state provides to its citizens can collapse very fast. Um, so there is no reason to get desperate and think like there is no, there is nothing ahead, you know. Even the hard times bring the challenges and bring the possibilities. Bring the possibilities of the better future, bring the possibilities of um, free society and bring possibilities of the things that might have been unimaginable. The things that you might have thought, oh, it's just a utopia. And I think through this fights that we learn in the other places around the world, we make a new world possible. That's it. Thank you.